Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective, and today I have a very special video for you. Many of you might be aware of the review I did of this book, The Race for Perfect, The Inside Quest to Design the Ultimate Portable Computer by Steve Hamm. And if you've seen that video, you will know that I actually had the opportunity to sit down with Steve and ask him a whole bunch of questions. And this is actually the introduction to that interview video. If you are not aware, he also authored several other books, two of which I have. One is Smart Machines, which is IBM's Watson and the Era of Cognitive Computing. And then his most recent book, which is co-authored with Frank Slootman, and that is The Rise of the Data Cloud. And this has to do with the rise of Snowflake, big data, and how the cloud plays a part in it. And if you are interested in any of these subjects, I cannot recommend Steve's books enough. He is able to take a very complex concept and explain it in its most fundamental terms and does so in what I find to be a narrative style. So he's talking to the, the movers and the shakers and the designers behind all of these ideas and really getting behind what motivates those people, what creates the ideas and the whole process in between. And they're just generally good reads. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the interview to you. It is about 50 plus minutes long, so make sure you've got a coffee, perhaps a scone or other confectionery as you see fit. And I will also be leaving an MP3 file of the entire interview in the description down below, along with some supplemental information. I really do want to thank Steve Hamm again for sitting down with me, and I would encourage you, if you do like this kind of content, to make sure you're following the channel so the next time I have the opportunity to interview someone in the industry, you'll be the first to know about it. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Hamm. I know a little bit about you from your work with Business Week, uh, several of the books that you've published, but for those people that might not be familiar with your work, uh, who is Steve Hamm and what has been your journey with uh, journalism and journalism around technology? Okay. Well, um, so Steve Hamm lives in New Haven, Connecticut, and I am a freelance writer and also a documentary filmmaker at this point. And I can get to the, into those in more detail later, but just the history. So I became a journalist uh, in 1979. Uh, at the time, my wife and I had a bookstore in Danbury, Connecticut, which was not succeeding. So I kind of cast around for, you know, what could I do? And, and journalism looked like it. And I did that and I, and I worked my way up from a, a weekly to a small daily to a medium-sized daily to a big daily and then to um, magazines, including uh, PC Week and then Business Week. I was at Business Week for 12 years, which was, you know, that was the best job I ever had. And it was a wonderful job. And I, um, I got a chance to learn how to write long form journalism. And I ultimately, I wrote more than 30 cover stories for Business Week. And the technology part of it was interesting. I, when I was back in the, in the late eighties, I was the business editor actually here in New Haven at the, at the newspaper. And we had a, we had just, we had basically constituted a business section. I mean, in daily newspapers, especially medium sized ones, maybe they had one business writer. Well, we put together like a staff of eight and it was clear that, that technology was an element of the business community there, a small but interesting element. And uh, so I, I started to learn about it a little bit. And then one day I saw this ad in Publishers Weekly, that, which was then the magazine of, of the industry, for assistant technology business editor in, mm -hmm. in San Jose, California at the Mercury News. And I applied for that job and I got the job. Now, this tells you, I mean, they hired me with, with no technology experience, no knowledge, no background <laughs> to be their technology editor at the Mercury News, which was the probably the only newspaper in America at the time that actually knew anything about technology. And, uh, you know, I think there might've been one tech, you know, tech business reporter at the, uh, in fact, there was one who was at the Wall Street Journal and he'd just been hired from the Mercury News. So that was really my lucky, my big lucky break because it turned out the technology 
you know, was on the rise. When I arrived there in, in 89, I remember the, the, the editor, the business editor said, oh, Steve, you know, it's good that you're here in Silicon Valley, but it's kind of too bad because you really missed everything. It's really kind of getting very stable and boring. And, uh, you know, of course, I had, I had missed a lot of the silicon and some of the early software and some of the early PC, but really I hadn't, the most exciting stuff was yet to come. So I got to ride, you know, especially, obviously the most important thing was the internet. And uh, I was, I'll tell you a funny story. I was recently, in, I'm involved in a project and we had a group meeting on Zoom and one of the guys, a lot of the people in the project are like me, They're, we're older. And one of the guys was relatively, he was a newcomer to the group. And we were talking about something and he said, well, you know, I, 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 I'm not really sure I wanna raise this, but it seems like there's something, there's a generational gap here. It's like young people really understand the importance of the internet and you guys haven't been discussing the internet and maybe you guys just aren't really familiar with it and stuff like this. And I actually had to go to another meeting right then, but I thought to myself, well, I was essentially in the room when the internet was invented. So I have a little bit of a sense of it, but I, but I realized the reason that he had this per false perception was people used to think of the internet as a very interesting fish in the ocean, but now we all understand that it's the water in the ocean. And you, you, know, you don't have to talk about it all the time, but it is the framework for almost everything that we we do in our society, certainly in business, certainly in technology. It's the, it's the backbone of communications, of collaboration, of gathering knowledge, of storing knowledge. And now with cloud computing, it's the whole plumbing for, for computing. So it's, anyway, it was, it was a very interesting thing. Absolutely. So anyway, yeah, I mean, I went to IBM for, after Business Week, uh, I went to IBM for six, years, six and a half years. I loved it there. It was a very innovative time. They were doing some smarter planet stuff, really about, it was the beginning of IoT and big data. And I was involved in that. And then we, we kind of moved right over into um, AI and cognitive computing because the Watson uh, machine that they put together won on Jeopardy and really awoke, yeah, there we go, awoke, awoke people to... Uh, the potential for artificial intelligence. And that's where I wrote uh, Smart Machines with J John Kelly, who was then the head of research. So anyway, but I've been, I've done a few other things, but now I, I, some of my freelances with tech companies, like I do a lot of work with Snowflake. Do you know Snowflake? I do, I've, uh, I'm halfway through the book oh, now. Oh, there we go, yes, Rise of the Data Cloud. Yeah, I wrote that with Frank Slootman and they, last September, they went public and they really had, it was the, it was the most successful um, IPO of an enterprise software company or cloud company. And so it's been fun to work with them and I do a podcast with them called The Rise of the Data Cloud. So anyway, oh. that's kind of where we are. Oh, that's awesome. So as you've mentioned, you've got a huge amount of experience across the industry and you've been telling these stories for, for many, many years, how would you describe your, your story style or pardon me, your, your storytelling style? Well, you know, I came up through newspapers and newspapers is very structured. There's something called the inverted pyramid where you, you give the big, most important facts at the top, and then you kind of give more and more detail at the bottom and more explanation. So it's kind of a stack of information. It's very, it's very formal. But then what, you know, then there, even within daily newspapers, there were and still are feature stories, which are more relaxed in their form. And, but it was a business week that I learned to tell, you know, the, the more in-depth story. And sometimes they were profiles of people. You know, I did, a, I did an important profile of Mark Andreessen from Mosaic and Net. Netscape, and it was at the time that Netscape was bought by, um, was it bought by AOL? Wait, wait, wait. I'm trying to think. What was the order of things there? Yeah, I think that was. I think that's how it worked. But um, 
and then uh, AOL merged with AOL Time Warner, which was one of the biggest kind of like, people always talked about the convergence of technology, communications and uh, entertainment. And that was it, you know, and it turned out that it, the merger was not successful, but it was very interesting nonetheless. So yeah, so s storytelling and you know, more in depth storytelling using a lot of anecdotes to bring people to life, to bring situations to life, uh, to really help people understand things deeply, you know, satisfy their cu curiosity. And it was in that process that, you know, video storytelling started to emerge. I was at PC Week, which is later called E Week, and then we created ZDNet. And all of that and CNET were all created at the same time. And those were the first truly news websites, you know. And they were on technology, of course, because that was the audience that was on compute, you know, who, who wanted to consume it that way. So we basically, you know, created online journalism. We, you know, we explored it and we, we made it up as we went along. And then at a certain point, it was clear that, you know, video was going to be part of it. And I, I think initially we put video up on our websites, just little snippets. But they were, you know, I mean, these were modem. People were watching this with modems. Yeah. And it was a terrible experience. But we kind of did it because we could, you know, because we knew that it was going to be important. And then you, you just see the, the tremendous advances have come with video storytelling, you know, the, the, the YouTube. But before that, I mean, there, there started to be, you know, I think iPhone, it wasn't the first version of iPhone, but I think... Um, as I recall, it was 2009, like the second or third version of iPhone actually had video built in. Uh, it was very low quality, but it was built in there. And then it was about that same time that some um, single purpose kind of mini canny, cam, camcorders came along. There was, the, there was something called the Flip. Uh, mini camcorder, which I think Cisco later bought. And then there was uh, some of the others, you know, Kodak was a camera company and they, they came out with that. And that was actually the first camera that I used. It, it kind of looked like an early iPhone. It was kind of like just the shape and size and you could kind of point, hold it up and point it at people. And sometimes, usually they didn't know what it was. <laughs> As a matter of fact, yeah. let me tell you a story. I was once doing an investigative story about abuses of um, H-1B visas for Indian software programmers. And some unscrupulous companies were bringing in people from India illegally to work in America. And they were like young people and they were just like putting them up in houses in these little cities in New Jersey, just like 11 young, pe young guys from wow. Hyderabad in a, in a house. And I actually learned about one of these and I actually went to visit the guy and I had my, my Kodak you know, camera on top of a monopod. So the monopod was like six, five feet tall. And this little camera on the top of it, when I rang his doorbell, I was just standing there with this thing. And he didn't, he kind of gave it a look. And I, and I, I, I turns out unscrupulously did not tell him that the camera was on and he you know he told me his whole side of the story and then I said oh by the way I've been shooting this and he said ah it's all right <laughs> <laughs> so he admitted to some misdemeanors but no felonies so anyway that's that's how I got started with the video part of the storytelling oh that's really cool and I guess that kind of leads into my next question, which is how I first encountered your work. Uh, it was actually during my research on unique ThinkPads to cover for the YouTube channel. Yeah. And the X300 was on a lot of people's lists. So I went and did a little bit of research. And at the time that I was doing the research, I think there were three videos, maybe four that were popping up on YouTube. One was an advertisement um, for the 25th anniversary of ThinkPad. 
There was, I believe, an interview with Richard Sapper. Mm -hmm. And then there was a Microsoft research talk that you gave. It must have been just before or after the book was published mm -hmm. uh, with the same title, uh, The Race for Perfect. And I remember watching the, the first hour of that talk uh, when you were kind of going through the work that went into the book. And then I said, okay, I need to get this book because it seems to me like the textbook on the video or the video series that I want to make. Yeah. yeah. So when I sat down with David Hill, he kind of gave me his version about how you got involved, but I would love to hear how, uh, from your point of view, how this whole thing started for you. Yeah. Well, Let's see. I was at I was at Business Week, and I was covering IBM, and I think I started covering IBM in two thousand four. And I think it was in late two thousand four, if I have it right, that they announced they were going to sell their um, PC division, which was essentially ThinkPad. That was where the value was, and uh, you know they just didn't want to be in quote commodity hardware. And, uh, you know, I think they had put a lot of money and effort and engineering into ThinkPad. Uh, and it was a, a great product line with lots of, I mean, tremendous innovation. In it. They, they'd put some from their PC division, but also some of their researchers, IBM Research had put some stuff into it. And um, they, but they, you know, they saw it wasn't their future. And they uh, kind of put it up for sale. And I don't think, you know, wasn't, I can't remember who bid on it, who all, but Lenovo, which had just changed its name to the Lenovo from Legend, which was the leading Chinese uh, PC company, uh, was the bidder. And, uh, you know, they didn't pay very much for it. I, I think it was like maybe like one and a half billion dollars, you know, and, uh, but, you know, IBM, IBM, they, I think, as I recall, they had a, a phrase they, they called revenues that didn't produce uh, profits, empty calories. Oof. So, uh, yeah, and ThinkPad, unfortunately for them, was an empty calorie thing because they, it cost a lot of money and they were selling a high quality product into a commodity marketplace that it was very price sensitive. So they really couldn't make money on it. And then, you know, at the ultra high end, there was Apple and they really, as good as ThinkPad was for the, for the, the business market, it wasn't really a multimedia machine. Uh, and Apple had that and they had the, they could charge the premium and they had the, the great brand. So, you know, so IBM sold it and, and Lenovo bought it. And I, I say very shortly, I met um, uh, Yang Yang Chen, who was the, the chairman. He was at that time a young man. <laughs> you know, this was 15 years ago. Well, maybe he, isn't. he was probably in his 30s, I guess. But he was a very entrepreneurial guy and a very a good leader, even as a young man. And he was really, you know, he had his, the founders, he wasn't one of the founders, but he'd been brought in as the first president who wasn't a founder so he was a guy who grew up in a in a china that was changing the founders were really they were part of a chinese government research organization but they were allowed to spin out this company at a time of liberalization but they were always kind of a quasi you know it's, it's part of state capitalism really and how does that really work and who really controls it kind of thing but um, but Yang Yang Ching was uh, clearly he was going to take it into the into the world, and he did. And I think he did a really good job. I mean, they had a couple of American CEOs. One, the IBM guy who was in, kind of stuck with it for a year, and then he was gone. And they brought another American in, and he was with it for about four years. I think I, I think what really happened was the Chinese. Um, kind of learned what the leaders learned what they needed to know from these Americans to run the company, and then they ran it. But it re, but it remained a company, a global company. You know, lots of Americans, lots you know some Europeans, 
Japanese engineering, mm -hmm. you know, I think still is a very important part, though I think the Chinese brought some industrial design to it, but I would say that the core engineering uh, that has stuck with ThinkPad is still uh, Japanese. So anyway, that was really cool. And just as I think you recorded an interview with David where he described meeting me and it was, it was down in, in North Carolina, which was then the headquarters of the company. And I had just expressed interest in, you know, as the, as the company was transferred from IBM to Lenovo, I just kind of went with it. I mean, I didn't leave covering IBM, but I, but I uh, was interested in seeing what happened with this. It was really a global phenomenon. And um, I could see that Lenovo could become the largest PC maker in the world. And it wasn't just a few years later, they were. Um, so it was a, but, but to be invited into the process of following a new product that was being developed because of the pride of the people in the company, but also because of the ambition of the Chinese leadership to show this isn't some junk, you know, cheap stuff we're making. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna innovate within an industry where, where innovation really had dropped off. You know, uh, I think it's picked up again in a lot of ways, but, um, but that was it. And so to be inside of it was great. And so I followed it and I talk, I think I probably talked to David uh, every week for you know six months or something like that and then he would tell me who else to talk to and and i think i you know i i, I talked to richard sapper in italy i just happened to be on vacation in italy with my family we were in venice and i said hey let's go over to milan there's a guy over there and it would be fun to meet him and we met him in his apartment and uh the funny thing was uh I'm trying to think how it went. Oh, I was I was interviewing him and probably tape recording it. I and I handed my little uh, I must have had some kind of, I forget what camera I had at the time. Oh, it was some kind of regular camcorder. I handed it to my wife and I said, you know, you shoot some video while I'm doing this. And she shot some video, but she wasn't used to camcorders, so she turned it on its side <laughs> at a certain <laughs> point. She said, oh, that was, it was more of, that was a better frame for, it was a better composition. And I later looked at it and I said, holy shit. And I said, that's not going to work. So anyway, that's, it was, it was wonderful. And, you know, at, at the end, there's a, there's a dramatic moment, which you can never, you never, when you embark on this, you don't know what will happen. Will it even be a product? And then there was the day that they were, they had essentially finished their product, but not launched it yet. And Apple uh, launched um, their ultra thin computer. And of course these guys flipped out and said, oh my God, we put all this work into this thin computer. And then they, they you know, they're gonna, just gonna take all of our energy. But then it turned out that I get the, 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 the Apple showed, oh, you could slip it inside a, a manila a folder an envelope and the guys from from uh from lenovo ran and got an envelope and it just barely fit inside it was a little, little bit of a tight fit but um anyway that was that was a pretty good story and you know the book uh, unfortunately you know i really enjoyed doing the book but it came out right uh as the financial crisis 2008 hit and there was, you know, like, there was no merchandising, there was no marketing, there was no advertising, there was nothing. So I think that it, I mean, I would have, I would have hoped that it reached a, a broader audience, but it really didn't sell well. I don't, I don't really know how much it sold, but, you know, nevertheless, I look back on it and say, I'm glad I did it because for various reasons, because it was interesting, but also I don't think anybody had ever written the story of mobile computing because that's built into it too. Uh, I go right back to the beginning of, mo of mobile computing and I tell the story and I, 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 I still don't think it's ever been told. So that's the book where it is. And it's important to have the history, you know. 
Absolutely. And you do bring up a, a good point is that on, on at face value, you know, you first look at the book and you read the back and you're like, oh, this is about a, a book about a ThinkPad, but it's, it's so much more than just a book about a ThinkPad. Like this goes back to why uh, two pounds is like the ideal target and how that came about. Mm -hmm. And that actually leads into the next question is because I know that you interviewed so many people to write that book and to tell that story. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering from what you remember, was there kind of like one interview that is the most memorable for you when you were writing this book that kind of just stood out? Well, there were many wonderful interviews, but I would say that the interviews with David Hill, not just one, but many of them were fantastic because, you know, I had never spent time kind of living in the head of a someone with a design consciousness. And David just loved, I mean, he grew up in Kansas, which is, you know, not, is the kind of farm territory, but somehow he got into design and he just loved well design. He loved industrial design. And I don't know if he's, did you learn about his motorcycles when you spoke to him? No, he never told me about oh, the he has. He is a collector of motorcycles and a ride. He doesn't just collect them, he rides them. And he, he, I think he spent his extra money in his life um, investing in very expensive and very nice motorcycles. And I just think the, that whole thing, uh, you know, and I, I, I think the other thing was that even when he was talking about, how, you know, what's the code name for this project? He had a sense of the metaphor and he had a sense of, you know, what resonated and just the idea, you know, there's a tremendous amount of respect for Japanese, certain aspects of Japanese culture, you know, and I think the tea ceremony and the, 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 the rock garden and, you know, the Buddhist stuff, but then there's the samurais and the, the, you know, the beauty and precision and quality of a samurai sword. And he fixed on the Kodachi code name because that is the name of um, a short, a very short, small, fast samurai sword. So you've probably seen the, the film Kill Bill. Yes. Yeah. So you've seen a lot of you've seen a lot of samurai sword work, mm -hmm. um, but the Kodachi still, I guess you know when when you're holding the when you're holding one up in the air, you could do some fast work underneath or something like that. Anyway, so that was the um, that was the name of it. And I and I and he just he was he was a great storyteller, you know, and uh, you know he stuck with that company a long time. I mean, I think in a lot of cases when companies get acquired. You know, within a couple of years, most of the of the best people leave. Uh, but in this case, he and I think that I, I don't know what the story is with the Japanese uh, engineering team. These these were some of the top engine, you know, PC or uh, engineers in the world. Uh, Nido Sun was the, I forget that's what we called him, but I forget what his what his his real name was. Uh, you know, they were wonderful. The thing with Richard Sapper was wonderful because he had he had his early designs were for I think they were Mercedes, and then he got into furniture and lighting and lots of other things. He designed elect an electric bicycle. He actually had it in his apartment, and he had in his studio. He had a nice table and he had a, he, when we visited, of course, he had a bunch of think pads out so, so we could talk about him. Uh, but he had all these little kind of knickknacks around the room, but they, but they weren't like tourists, you know, souvenirs. They were objects that had interesting shapes and forms and material. Some were wood, some were metal. And uh, I think they were just things that he had kind of scattered around him that were touchstones of the kinds of things that he liked or the qualities that he liked in design. So I would say that was very inspiring, you know? Uh, I was very sad a few, you know, he was elderly when I met him and I think he was ill. 
But, uh, oh, I remember when uh, David Hill told me of his, he, you know, for him to work with Sapper was fantastic for a designer because he was one of the most famous designers in the world. And to be kind of learned at his, you know, he wasn't a kid, but he was learning from the best. And he described one time that he was in Italy and Sapper had a house up on a lake. I don't know if it was Lake Como or something like that in Italy, all glass side or something. And, and he described this incredible drive up the, you know, fast sport, you know, Sapper's really fa oh, too fast sports car up the curvy roads into the mountains and up to this house. And it was like, you know, sometimes you get into a spot like that and you feel like, oh my God, you pinch yourself. And you say, is this really me? And I think uh, I've had experiences like that too, you know, in my, in my career that have been marvelous, you know. And uh, you treasure those things. And you try to, when you do storytelling, you try to, if you've got experiences like that in that, you try to pass those along. I mean, do you know who, well, um, Patagonia, the designer and retailing, retailer of outdoor clothing, yep. founded by Yvonne Chouinard. I actually went, I did a cover story about Yvonne Chouinard's leadership style and philosophy, business philosophy. And I went to visit him up at his place in uh, the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. And he, uh, he took me fishing on, the, on, the, on the, the Snake River, which is a famous fishing stream. And as we were going, there was a little bit of a lightning storm and a, and a herd of buffalo were charging at us. And at the last minute, there was a stream, between, a very small stream between us and the buffalo. At the last minute, they stopped. <laughs> and we weren't sure, was it that little stream or did they just look at a... Mm three guys with fishing poles and anyway, so that's a, that becomes an anecdote that then, even though it's not about business at all, it draws people in, you know, so anyway, but yeah, I mean, what I try to do in interviews is ask all the obvious questions and then try to ask a few unobvious questions. And I often found that sometimes in interviews that were very formal and not necessarily for this book, but in, you know, in covering tech, interviewing a CEO or a top head of engineering, you'd have, you'd have the end of the formal interview and you'd kind of start getting up and it, it would be after the formal interview is over that you'd ask a final question or they would say, Oh, they mentioned something. And that thing would be the most interesting thing. And of course, you'd have to kind of like memorize what they said and let, you know, get outside <laughs> the back of the car and write every word as, as you could uh, recall it in, in, in your notebook. <laughs> no, that is awesome. Um, what would like, because you've had a lot of experiences across many different industries in your career so far. Mm -hmm. Has there been like one particular project that you've been involved with that was kind of like the, the, the best time of your life or are you still working on it? Well, you know, the Kodachi thing was, was great fun. I mean, I've had great things. I, I early in the night in the, in this century when outsourcing was really taken off, I was given the opportunity to cover the rise of the Indian tech industry. And it was just, I think I went to India like eight or nine times in a number of years. And, and that was really interesting. And it wasn't about hardware at all. It was all about software and services. Um, I guess the um, Smart Machines book was a great project because it was all, it was at a turning point in history when AI previous to that had really been an academic, it was an academic pursuit and it was pursued along uh, domains within academia. And, uh, you know, there had been some hype about it at various times in the, in, the in the 20th century, all of it ending with disappointment and uh, 
reputational damage. And uh, so when, when they put together Watson, the Watson technology, and I guess that was probably in about 2008, it really popularized, uh, it really showed the power of artificial intelligence. And they used some AI techniques, but they used a lot of different techniques. So, but we actually called it cognitive computing because it, it, because it wasn't just like those AI disciplines, it was much broader than that. But when I arrived at IBM in 2009, I arrived there in, uh, I think December 2009 and then early 2010, they were starting to say, well, we've got this technology. How do we have impact on the world? So they actually had a big meeting at IBM Research up in Yorktown Heights, uh, New York, north of New York City. And they invited all sorts of IBMers in and then all sorts of people from industries. And they ran this 10 hour program that was basically a brainstorm of how do we make AI, cognitive computing, have an impact in the world. And because, you know, the, the, the Jeopardy game, it was a gimmick, right? A very exciting, impressive gimmick. It's like a, car, you know, parlor trick. <laughs> and uh, so we did that. And out of that came uh, a tremendous amount of thinking. And it really was, it turned the corner into people understanding that AI really could have a big impact. And, now, of course, it is having a big impact. Uh, a lot of the AI that we have now, you know, the consumer doesn't experience, experience it as a uh, something that they get, a value they get directly. In fact, a lot of the AI in the world is being used by businesses to be more efficient to, and to understand their businesses better. But also, unfortunately, to understand consumers better, so to better manipulate them. So it's kind of disappointing that this is the way AI is being used, um, but not surprising because capitalism does raise, you know, it reigns supreme in the world. Um, I'm Right now, I'm actually involved in another project, which is a totally non-capitalistic project. It's called Pivot Projects. And it's a, a group of people who came together in the midst of COVID with the idea of seeing if uh, they could do something um, to make uh, kind of coming out of it to pivot in, a new, in new and more positive directions using a variety of, of thinking tools and also computing tools. And the primary thinking tool is um, the idea of systems thinking, which is understanding things within, within context and the relationships between different sorts of things. Um, and it's, I actually think that systems thinking is one of the biggest ideas of the latest, the late 20th century. And you can combine it and you can now model systems and you can put those models into computers and you can test your models or you can add to your models or you could simulate if this happens, what will happen to the, to the system, not, not, not your computing system, but to the real system out in the world. Then you can combine that with some AI research tools that really help you find uh, unexpected connections and um, insights that are very difficult for humans to manage just with their own brains. And um, so this group is basically taking these two very powerful things, systems thinking and modeling and AI, and trying to use those to make the world more sustainable and resilient. So this is my idea of a good way to use um, thinking use our intellects, our collective intellects, and to, to augment those with AI. Look it up, pivotprojects.org. I'm going to do that. You can join. <laughs> Anybody can join. Anybody who with an interest can join. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. 
So just to switch gears a little bit, we're definitely going to loop back to um, AI data, and I can already see the connections even informing in our conversation. As a person that's been around and documented technology for, for decades, you've seen the laptop go from this all the way down to this. Yes. And you've seen the, the power that these machines have kind of almost climb on an exponential curve. So maybe even just looking in the last decade uh, since you penned the race to perfect, how do you think the modern laptop of like 2021 has changed how we as a society operates? Well, it's really, it's part of, a, you, know, you know, like the, the modern light, ultra powerful multimedia equipped laptop alongside the powerful smartphone and, and the, you know, iPads and, you know, things like that um, have just really uh, made possible, you know, combined with the internet, the idea, you know, the idea of information, communications, collaboration at your fingertips. And I think Zoom is like the, is the, like the latest layer of new powerful capabilities that have come. Uh, but I, uh, you know, my, when I think about, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my little 13 inch MacBook Pro right now. So this machine, well, I don't really have the facts at my fingertips here, but you know, the computing power in it is, you know, probably more than a quote, supercomputer of 1980, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and just, you know, I just think uh, the, the fact that we can do things, I mean, when COVID came, it was these devices and the internet that enabled our society to cope and our, and our, you know, we didn't collapse. We didn't collapse. And it's because of these things. I mean, if people were, if for some reason these innovations hadn't happened and people really had to be in offices to get their work done. I mean, just think about that. I mean, here we are a year into it and it's, it ain't over, you know? So I think it's empowered, you know, it's, it's, it's made us, you know, made society and, and, the, and the business and the economy more resilient. It's empowered, it's obviously empowered individuals. The fact that you can do all this work on your little device that you can slip into your backpack or into or something smaller uh, and you can write a book or you can make a movie uh, you know that's really empowering or make youtube videos so i i, I do think it's been uh extremely um important in our society in the economy and in, in the powers of individuals and i think it's going to just continue I mean, I mean i don't think we're plateauing i think you know it's good just going to keep going and i and i think the you know these devices as the tools of collaboration is really where a lot a tremendous amount of advances are coming in the in the, the next little while i was on the phone on a call i mean it was, a, it was a webinar or something it was a leadership webinar and it had eric yuan of zoom and Jay Shri, I'm forgetting her last name, head of Arista Networks, and Frank Slootman, head of Snowflake. And um, Eric was talking about what's going to come next with Zoom. And he said, you know, one of the things we lose by working at home is we don't have those uh, chance encounters in the elevator, the hallway, or in the lunchroom, or uh, the, the um, water cooler. And he said, but, you know, we think that we can actually do that with Zoom. And we can, and he didn't really get in, go into detail, but my head started spinning on this. And I said, you know, what you could do is you could opt in to different kind of situations. And um, 
you could really have uh, a program understand what you're thinking about. Because it just, you know, it looks at your emails, looks at what you say, all this kind of stuff. It sees these patterns. This is what this guy is interested in. And you could, you could say, everybody in the company that's interested in these things, or like yesterday, so-and-so had this conversation, and it was actually a pretty damn cool idea. And they could say, and you could get an alert on your desktop that says, or your, your, you know, your, your screen that says, you know, you've been talking about such and such. You've been thinking along these lines. But, and so-and-so in the other division in Japan yesterday said, this, you might be interested in that. You know, is that something you'd be interested in? If you'd like, I will connect you right this minute and see if he's available. And you can, you can talk about it. I mean, think about that. So it's no longer, a ch it, it's, it has all of the value of a chance encounter, but it's not a chance encounter. It's like an arranged marriage of, of um, you know, collaboration, collective intelligence. And I think that um, when you have things like that happening, uh, it's really, I mean, we're talking some very serious uh, innovation opportunities are going to come out of that or, or whatever. I mean, if it's, if it's a company that, you know, companies spend a lot of time on efficiency. They spend a lot of time on customer acquisition and retention, and they spend a lot of time on innovation and it, and that kind of capability would help in all of us. No, absolutely. So I know that this, this next question, we've actually kind of talked about it over email just a tiny bit, but you know, for the benefit of those people that haven't hacked into our emails yet, um, as, a, as a documentary filmmaker, technology has definitely changed like how easy it is to create something like that. And I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes to share your, your journey with that, because I know that you, you started off with that little Kodak camera and things have kind of evolved since yeah. then. Yeah. 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 I, um, yeah. So I, uh, you know, I was always a word guy, though I did take photographs a little bit with, you know, and I was personally, and I, and I did take some photographs professionally for some of my publications, but and I, and I, you know, when, when in the early part of this century, you could see that video storytelling was going to be important. And I said, I'm not going to kind of ghettoize myself as, oh, I only write words. So I uh, wanted to be on the forefront of that. So I was one of the people at Business Week who did the most with it. And at that time, I just shot little clips with that camera, with that Kodak ZI8, I think was the name of it. And um, so, and I would bring them in and they had a little tiny, you know, two, two like post-production guys. And they would put together, they'd string them together a little bit. And, uh, but it was basically just a clip, uh, a short clip that would be, you know, additive. Here's the story and here's, a, you, you wanna hear what this guy has to say, boom, boom, boom. And then, you know, when I went to IBM, uh, you know, they were, they were much more sophisticated and they were hiring outside, um, you know, video teams, sometimes connected to some of the big communications firms, sometimes independents to make short videos. And they were short videos for, um, you know, for, the, for being shown on the internet. And, you know, and I started to do a little bit of that myself just because, you know, you'd have to have a real budget to, get, to hire somebody from the outside. And literally they were paying like 80,000 bucks for some short videos and stuff like that. And they were, and they were all very focused on, you know, like fast moving, shiny lights, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff, which I think is the worst kind of storytelling. I think in fact, that stops people from perceiving, from being thoughtful, from understanding. So, I started making very bad storytelling videos for IBM. And then gradually over time, I 
and I just bought I bought my own equipment and I was at first editing on my my ThinkPad, but it it's they you know they 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 acquired the ThinkPads just as desktop tools, and they were not configured to do editing, and I found that it was at the time it was probably 2010 2011. Even if I added, you know, a bunch of RAM, you know, it still wasn't working. The everything was clunky and lousy, and you know, blah blah blah. So I persuaded them to buy me a MacBook Pro, and that that was the, really the tool that enabled me to do editing. And I I had my own, you know, Canon camcorders, little, you know, like a seven hundred, eight hundred dollar kind of thingy. And uh, gradually, I just bought better and better equipment. And, uh, and learned how to use it more. And, you know, and then when I left, I left IBM in 2016 and I started uh, working for Yale University. And I just did that for about a year before I went freelance. But I, I live in this town and I started thinking, this town needs, has lots of stories and the town needs it needs to be improved. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, in some ways, it's a great town. It's a university town, big hospital system, lots of interesting stuff, but also it was an industrial town. The industry's left and it has some very serious poverty. So I started uh, telling stories about communities here and stuff like that. And, you know, gradually I just learned more and more. And I got a, a friend who's an editor and, but still, I mean, when I think about my MacBook Pro, you know, so I have a MacBook Pro. At this point, I have a, I have a camcorder, uh, a Sony that probably costs a couple thousand dollars. And I have other equipment that, you know, it probably racks up to a few thousand more. But when you think about it, so I'm making documentary films with a basic capital cost of maximum $5,000. In the old days, even with digital uh, editing, the first digital editings, I think were called, they were Avid, was a specialist uh, hardware, a tower. And I think the entry level editing computer cost $10,000. And the, and the camera equipment, you know, for film, you know, and, and even, for, even for digital was extremely expensive. So now, you can be kind of a semi-pro documentary maker like me with very uh, low cost. And uh, one thing that allows you to do is uh, you can make pretty good videos with very low costs and you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to charge for them. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I recognize that we're in a capitalist system, but I, the, and I want capitalists to succeed, though I'd like to be, them to be regulated much more than they are, because I think they're out of their minds in some ways and doing things that are very destructive to the environment and to human beings. But in my own work, you know, at my age, I don't want to, get, I don't, capitalism, baby, leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, so that's where I am. So the fact that it's so inexpensive, I can, I can make things without having to worry about charging somebody for it. So we show our films at churches and libraries, community halls, museums, <clears throat> theaters, um, film festivals and online. So that's that's my story as a documentary filmmaker. No, it's awesome, and you, you do bring up a good point that the lowering that cost really allows you to perhaps enter enter in with a bit more of a more genuineness uh, with what you actually want to do because you're not uh, as beholden to uh, certain people that might be controlling the money or yes. uh, controlling the story, you, you can essentially remove those more or less and uh, create some really authentic content. Yeah. 
even in the even in the nonprofit world, you know, a lot of documentaries are made with sponsorships. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, sponsorship that is hemming you in. You're not going to, you know, you, somebody gives you a grant or some money for some, for a project, you've kind of sold it to them in a, in general. But what happens if it if it takes a turn, and mm-hmm. suddenly the turn that it takes is harmful to them? You know. Um, you want to be free to go where the story goes. So it's even the sponsorship is is has some danger in it. So we don't even like to do those. And I've I've approached. Um, we have public talent, uh, public TV, public radio in in um, here, and they're you know supported a little bit by government, but mainly by donors and also by big sponsors. And they are very kind of status quo oriented. And in the kind of content they show and the way they show it and their whole business model, they have a business model, of course. And uh, they uh, really, I've encountered these people and this is like, oh my God, they're just very stuck in old think. And uh, so I haven't done any, I haven't had any luck persuading public television to show my films. <laughs> So uh, one thing about films, and this is a difficult thing, is when you, you know, books sometimes, uh, nonfiction books, even fiction books, films, documentaries, they hold a mirror up to society. And if they really are honest and they're going after a serious, conflictious issue, People do not look, like to look at what they see in the mirror. Yeah. Uh, they have narratives that help them digest and live comfortably in the world. And uh, so you can, you know, it's sometimes difficult to get people to look. And I, that's something I'm trying to figure out. What's the right mix? How do you, how do you make it possible for people to look? No, that's a good, that's a good expression. Be open-minded. Yeah. Definitely food for thought. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So speaking of food for thought, if uh, you have a crystal ball in front of you and you look into it and you peer into the future, what do you think might be the, the next big thing in mobile technology? Well, you know, the most convenient thing to carry about is not a laptop. It's a smartphone. So I think, you know, using the smartphone as the platform for Zoom calls with, you know, natural language processing that is extremely accurate and very quick, maybe real time. Mm -hmm. So you can have a conversation and you don't have to take notes because your notes are being taken and you can say, hey, wait a second. You know, you said this a minute ago. Let's go back and look at that. Maybe we should explore this or maybe the notes are being taken and maybe the AI is watching and, and understanding what you're interested in and also understanding, you know, with somebody else's, what, that there are other ideas that might connect with you and you might get alerts on that. And you might, so the, just having that device be more of your main tool. Mm. I mean, I think right now in business, most of the people who are doing real work are using a laptop. Yeah. <clears throat> the executives, a lot of the executives probably predominantly use their smartphone. But I think that, um, I think that, that smartphones are going to become even more capable. They're going to have more dimensions. They will really be a companion. Very helpful. You know, you have to work with all these things where I've talked about futuristic things. You have to work through the privacy issues. 
yeah. and how you're managing those. You have to have a, you have to decide up front what the rules are and how it how it's done and all that kind of stuff. So I think that's how things are used, how knowledge is used. But I think I think there's tremendous capability there, and uh, so I I think you know I, I talk about this as a tool of business or serious life. Obviously, they're gonna, they're gonna you know TikTok. There's gonna be other crazy, w- wonderful wastes of time will be invented. <laughs> I uh, my son is 33, so. He's he started to age out of some of the earliest stuff, but he sh- he showed TikTok. I mean, I knew TikTok existed for a while, but he actually took me on a tour of it, and I was shocked and dismayed at how absolutely silly and stupid it is. And uh, and I said, I just hope young people aren't spending all their lives doing this. And obviously, you're not, but. Uh, but then recently, I've actually run into some people who are using TikTok in really interesting ways. I ran into a musician who goes on, and there'll be somebody from somewhere else in the world playing, you know, a, a minute on a, a beautiful traditional instrument, and he'll take that and he'll, you know, he'll come, he'll write something and he'll prepare something, and then he'll make a tic- he'll do a TikTok on top of that, which is a duet of his banjo with this Mongolian woman playing a, a, a one string instrument, you know? And I think that that kind of thing brings us together and helps us understand each other. And even, I mean, even TikTok in general, that's transcending global boundaries. I mean, kids in America are seeing Korean TikToks and, you know, all this kind of stuff because you don't even have to understand, I mean, just, it's so much just visual or music or people shaking themselves around in different ways. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> or pets. Yeah. So I think it's, there is a, a very positive aspect to TikTok also, even within the silliness of it. I recently, you know, I, I don't buy computer. I don't buy the latest computer always. I, and I had, I had a, I had a five-year-old computer, it broke, which is the first time I ever had a computer break. And then I bought a new MacBook Pro, but it was just before the Apple, the new one with their own, I think it's called the F1 chip. Oh, the M1, yeah. M1 chip. So kind of irritated me because, you know, I'd like to be, (laughs) I'd like to be on the, on the, if I'm, I don't buy, I don't buy a new one very often, but typically I like to buy it at a generational shift, you know, you want 5G and you, and you, and you want the, you know, the best microprocessor made in the world for this purpose. So instead I got an Intel microprocessor and it's, and frankly, uh, I'm a little disappointed in it from uh, different points of view. But, uh, but I recently, but I finally, I had a, an iPhone six. So that's six years old. And I got an iPhone 12, but a mini, because I like a small, I like a small uh, smartphone. And it is a magnificent device. And I got to tell you, the, the videography and the, and the photography on that thing, that's good. That's good stuff. Uh, and I'm planning on using it for a short video on Tuesday. So I'm, see how it works out. It has tremendous stabilization technology mm. apples even the earlier uh, iphones this had much better stabilization e- even than my sony camcorder oh wow so it's really they, they they put some pretty good engineers on that yeah no that is <laughs> that is really cool yeah. i know that we're running a little bit over time but there was one more question that i'm pretty sure you'd like to to answer and that's got oh, to do with yeah. this guy right here yeah, um, yeah rise of the data cloud and i have to say i'm halfway through i just got past the part where the data and some of the networking technology was used to build some of these computer models that we were talking about earlier and it's the Johns Hopkins 
Yeah. 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 The one where they're predicting uh, where all that, where all the COVID scenarios yeah. are going to occur. Yeah. Like what led you to looking at big data as kind of the next book you were going to write? Well, you know, it's funny. When I was back at IBM, big data really was right at the beginning. You know, when we were talking about uh, cognitive computing, that was an element of it. And that was an element of, of the smarter planet idea as well, smarter cities. So I was very familiar with, with, uh, with big data. And, um, and I, I had some familiarity with uh, cloud computing, but you know, like some of the apps and then the infrastructure, AWS, you know, Azure, those kinds of things. But I really, th I didn't think of, I didn't think of my, my estimation of, of cloud computing of, of the infrastructure part of it was just, it's just plumbing, just plumbing. And um, then and I, I didn't really write much about it. I've been mainly writing about healthcare and medical science. And then uh, somebody from Snowflake approached me a couple of years ago uh, and said, uh, you know, we, we, th we think we want to write a book with our CEO. And, uh, and then actually what happened was um, that was Bob, God, I'm forgetting his last name. Muglia, Bob Muglia, who had been one of the top guys at, at Microsoft. And we, we kind of talked about it a little bit. And then right in the middle of it, he got fired. Even though he'd been tremendously successful, um, for some reason he had some he must have he had some serious friction with the board. You can you can be extremely successful in the tech industry and still get fired. Um, and they brought in Slootmans, and, and then it was like, you know, he, he's just gotta focus on this. And then after a while we came back. And they said it, and I had not understood uh, the data cloud uh, until then. And the data cloud is really important because if you migrate all the data from your company, all the digital data, and you might and you put it up in the cloud, and then if like a lot of organizations and companies put their data up in the cloud, pretty soon. You know where where you can you can do compute on it really fast. You can spin up and do an analytics thing. You only pay with Snowflake. You only pay for what you use. You know you don't have to have you don't have to have a data center. You don't have to buy computers anymore. You can have the most capable computers in the world at your beck and call, and you can uh, and you can put your data up very inexpensively in the storage. And then you could have like technology like Snowflakes that helps you ma integrate, manage, analyze, and share data. So it turns out that's totally revolutionary because we're on the path to, to a place where all the data in the world is potentially available for integration, right? So what does that do? That lets you understand the world around you in a much better, faster, immediate way. Some of the clients of Snowflake that I talked to say that they used to analyze before the data cloud, they used to analyze marketing campaigns and it would take them six months to get the results. Oh no. <laughs> now they get, the, get it in about six seconds. So, it's a big difference. So you can so you can you can run your campaign. You can modify it. You can analyze. It, you can test it. You can you can do it again. You can you can run you can run a different campaign every day for a week, and then figure out which one's working and why, and then you can put it all into that. So the data cloud is one of the most important advances in computing ever, and we're at we're at the front end of it. And it's going to be an incredible thing for businesses and for society. So that's my humble opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right, though, because not even like just businesses are using, you know, 
data and the cloud, but even more and more consumer solutions are coming out for the, the average person. If you, for example, even want to game recreationally, uh, there are services that essentially allow you to game in the cloud, like GeForce sure. Now, Google Stadia. Sure. You don't have to worry about buying and maintaining you know, thousands of dollars of hardware to play the games that you want to. It's the, the hardware is being offered to you remotely as a service. And that seems to be uh, a way that the world seems to be shifting, whether it's yeah. accessing software, hardware, you name it. Yeah. Remember before when I talked about the internet used to be one of the interesting fish in the ocean and now it's the ocean? Mm -hmm. Data, different data types and different kinds of data and different you know, data sets were, were fish in the internet ocean. Now they're the ocean. They're becoming the ocean. And, um, you know, this is going to be a very powerful thing. So we just have to make sure that as this happens, that we're very watchful about privacy and security. And we protect ourselves from malign forces, organized crime and, and state, you know, state uh, crime. And then we have to protect ourselves from the capitalists so that we, we still have agency, that we control our lives, we control our minds. Mm -hmm. We aren't just puppets being controlled by these powerful people with this powerful technology. Yeah, it could very well be the, the beginning of a tipping point and <laughs> who's to say which way it's gonna go. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say which way it's going to go. In democracies, we have a chance to make our, to assert ourselves. And we can use our computers. That's one of the powerful forces of, we can use the, the collaborative and communications powers and money, money raising, online money raising powers of computers to balance the power in the world so that the people have agency, have a say, you know. That's my, that's my closing thought. <laughs> and you know what, that's a, that's a perfect closing thought in my opinion. <laughs>